The way things are in the world today, people can often be so consumed with their lives and the circumstances that they do not truly understand what is happening big picture. Now for many of you that watch these videos regularly, you have to be aware of what is occurring in this world. We speak about so many things like the coming economic collapse, the coming civil war, and the divisions being spread with it. We understand the metaverse and the new system that is being built online for the system of the Mark of the Beast. We've spoken about the Great Reset, which is simply a reset on how the world works. And we've spoken about the New World Order, which is the main agenda for where this is all going. And there are many more topics as well. And if you've watched those videos and understood those topics and look at the world today, I hope that you have been at minimum mentally prepared for what is coming to this world. But my true hope is that you are spiritually prepared because these videos are not about shedding light on conspiracy theories. It's not about being negative and giving out bad news. It is all about giving out messages of urgency that our time is almost up. It's about understanding that there is not a lot of time to live in sin and in rebellion against the Most High. For me, understanding what is going on in this world, my prayers are that people are understanding that they need to get their spiritual houses in order and that they need to submit completely to the will of the Most High. People must come out of these wicked ways and mindsets that the world has trapped us all in. And we must all surrender our lives to what our Creator desires and requires of us. You know, the most ironic part to all of this is that those that know that they're not living right and those that know that they are sinners, these messages are not that hard for them to receive. But the hardest group of people to receive these messages are those that fall under the label of Christian and believe that because they have accepted Jesus, then they are saved and they do not have to think about judgment or not being accepted by Yah. They are the ones that quickly tell me, I don't need to preach to them. I need to preach to the lost, the unsaved. And if I speak on certain sins or issues, they either label that doctrine works-based or a bunch of legalism. These are honestly the hardest people to deliver these messages of repentance to because they don't want to accept that there may be things they are doing wrong. There may be things that they need to change. They do not want to deal with the requirement of humility that is needed in order to truly understand that the devil has been working aggressively against them to deceive them. There is doctrine that has been taught throughout the religion of Christianity that is literally placing chains of bondage that is keeping people away from being redeemed and covered under Messiah. The once saved, always saved doctrine is something that very much brings strife and contention within the body. But if everyone just got out of their own way and allowed the word to do the talking instead of letting the world do it, then there will be a much greater understanding of what needs to be understood today. This does not have to be something complicated to understand because Yahusha, Jesus, gave direct messages around all of this. And anytime I ever talk to someone who believes in the once saved, always saved doctrine, I always bring up these points and it's either ignored or they just simply walk away. In the book of Revelation, when showing John what was going to take place in the last days, before he showed the great tribulation, he first made sure that he gave messages to the church, his assembly. He was providing more grace to his followers, allowing them to understand the certain things they were doing wrong as followers of him. In his messages, he explained if they corrected these errors and wrong ways of living, they would be blessed. But if they did not, they would receive harsh judgment. In the times that we're in, these messages need to be highlighted and emphasized. And all that claim to be a believer in the death and resurrection of Yahushua the Messiah, who in English is transliterated to Jesus Christ. In case you're new to this channel, I want you to be clear in who I speak of. But I do refer to him in his Hebrew name. But like I was saying, anyone that claims to be a believer in the death and resurrection of Yahushua the Messiah and saved by grace, you must know what the Spirit says to the churches and apply it to your life, not tomorrow, but today, right now. We are in the last days, and if you love Yah, you must put your pride and ego aside and you must submit to Him. You must allow Him to convict you. He has spoken to the churches, and today you will hear exactly what He has to say. Let's begin. Okay, so like I was saying, People can go back and forth about the doctrine called once saved, always saved. But in the end, it doesn't matter. Yahushua delivered specific messages to the church 
that he desired that they knew. It is important that you understand that these messages were to the seven churches in the different areas of Asia Minor during the beginning of the church. At the end of each message, he says, Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Because while the message was directed towards these people during that time, it was a spiritual message that applied to the church in general. That's why he wants us to have ears to hear what the Spirit says. These messages were targeted to the church, the body of believers who claim belief in the Messiah. This message was not to the unsaved or unbelievers. It wasn't to the blasphemers or the ones who hated Messiah. No, these messages were directly given to the churches so that they could repent and turn away from the actions and behaviors that were despised and hated by Yahushua. If you say you love Jesus and you are his, your desire must be to submit to his ways and follow him. What did he tell those who saw him while he walked on the earth? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. So apply his words. If you desire to come after him, you need to deny your ego and your pride. You need to let go of the idols you have placed in priority of him, which oftentimes the idol is yourself. You need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. You need to bear your own sufferings as he did and follow after him. And what that consists of is first adhering to his word. So if he has messages to the church, as one who claims to follow him, you just cannot ignore them. You must read them, understand them, and apply them. So we're going to dig into these messages and understand what the Spirit says to the churches. These messages are found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We will read each letter to each church and discuss. We start with Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. This is the loveless church. Let's read. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. The city of Ephesus was a very important province in the area of Asia Minor. It was both the religious and commercial center of that area. This is the city where the Apostle Paul had his great ministry and wrote his epistle we know as Ephesians. Ephesus was a center for pagan worship. The temple of Diana stood during this time there. Remember, she was the mother goddess of the Romans, the goddess of fertility. If you don't understand anything about the mother goddess, I've made multiple videos explaining about her. You can watch the video about her here, or you can watch part one of the History of Religion series for more information. But the temple of Diana was mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 27 and 28. It says, so not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They speak on it. The church of Ephesus was obviously surrounded by pagans. In his message to this church, Yahushua explains that he knows their works and that they cannot bear those that are evil. The church of Ephesus was battling against evil. They did not tolerate it, and they spoke up against it. Amongst all that pagan worship that was prevalent there, they persevered in his name. But Yahushua said that even though they did that well, he still holds something against them, and that is that they have lost their first love. Remember, in the Gospel of Matthew, 
chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, when the Pharisees tried to test Yahushua saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Yahushua said to him, You shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, the first love that the church of Ephesus lost was love. Yahushua tells them to remember from where they have fallen. When the church of Ephesus was first started, Paul wrote to them in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Adun, Yahushua, and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You see, they were commended for their love. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to them strongly commanded them to grow in love. But obviously, as they started battling against all the wickedness and rebellion in that land of pagans, they grew in anger and hate. Like Yahushua said, they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But because of this hate, they lost their way of love and no longer walked in love. And that could have been towards each other too. So in his message to them, Yahushua told them to repent. He wants them to go back to the way of life they had before they departed from their first love. He again talked about their good, that they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, as he also did. The Nicolaitans were heretics that troubled the churches. Their teachings and practices were immoral and idolatrous, and the church of Ephesus hated it, as did Yahushua. The charge against Ephesus can be found amongst many of us. We live in a horrible, wicked generation, where everything that is wrong is now said to be right and everything that is right is said to be wrong. Many of us fight against evil all the time. Talking to the people that we know, battling on social media, it's just constant, it's everywhere. We're combating the lies and the evil that is being spread consistently to everyone. It can be tiresome, and if you're not fully grounded in your faith, it can provoke you through your flesh. You can find that we started off with a sincere love of Yahusha and wanted to help him grow his assembly his church, his bride. But as we continue to speak against evil, we might have become more combative and walk less in love. It's understandable how we got here. I mean, we hate evil and we don't tolerate it. But what can sometimes happen is that fighting too much can remove our walk in love. I'm speaking from experience. It happens that you desire to combat against evil so bad that you forget to walk in love. Learn your lesson from this. Remember, he knows you're faithful to him. He commends you for your good works in his name. But if you're not walking in love, your faithfulness and fight against evil is pointless and in vain. Listen, continue to fight against evil and have no tolerance for wickedness and rebellion. Speak against it when you're led to, but always do it from a position of love. And even those who come against you and provoke your flesh, do not let them provoke you so much that you allow them to move you away from how we should be as ones that follow Messiah. Do not forget how important love is. Okay, next we'll discuss the persecuted church. This is found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. This persecuted church does not have anything against them. They were just a church that suffered. They went through tribulation and poverty. Yahushua tells them that they are rich though, and that was because of their faith. They are going to suffer for their faith. Like we saw Polycarp, a bishop of Smyrna, a student of the Apostle John. He was burned alive for his faith in 155 AD. Yahushua tells them of their tribulations, but not to have fear. This may not be something that many people can understand right now, because life has not fully changed yet. But believe me, it's coming. 
We saw a glimpse of it when the solution was being pushed and we were standing against it. Many of us, because of our faith and trust in Yah, would not move along with the direction they were taking us. And many people lost their jobs and relationships with family and friends. Hold on to this type of faith. This is what is needed from you. Remain strong in your faith and always focus on Yahusha. Use these scriptures, use these commands when things get rough. And remember, Yahusha knows of your troubles and he is with you. He just wants you to have faith in him and trust in him. Do not fear. We should all read this letter to this church often as a reminder of an example of how we should be. We must carry this faith as we move during these times, as many of us will face the same persecution as we choose not to follow the direction this world leads us. Remain strong and persevere. You will be given a crown of life. Keep moving forward, holding on to your faith. Next is the compromising church. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone, a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. The city of Pergamos was an epicenter for paganism. During the time of the Apostle John, Pergamos, like Ephesus, was a very large religious center. It had great pagan temples like the Temple of Athena, and it also had the greatest library of the pagan world. In that land there was a great temple to Caesar Augustus, and then there's an altar to Zeus, as well as a temple to Dionysus. This was a pagan epicenter. Epicenter meaning the central point of something. So you can understand why Yahusha mentions it as Satan's throne. Those temples I mentioned are not ruins today, but there are still markers that show where they are. Some of the church of Pergamos held faith in Yahusha and did not deny him, but there were others that compromised. The doctrine of Balaam is found directly in the Old Testament, specifically in the book of Numbers, chapter 22 through 25. Balaam hired Balak to turn the hearts of Israel away from Yahuwah. Apparently, this was happening here in Pergamos. This can be a lot of us unknowingly. I know the common contrast that people like to use today is likening the modern day church to the church of Laodicea, which we will get to. But many of us are guilty of the charges against the church of Pergamos. You will be surprised to know and understand how many pastors and bishops that so many people sit under are like Balaam. They have been hired and recruited to draw people away from their faith in Yahusha, but it's done subtly and covertly. They have compromised the word and promoted wickedness in many ways. And many of today's churches have fallen in their traps because they are not reading the word on their own. Do not be of this compromising church. Today, in this world, Satan's throne could be in many different places. Living in mystery Babylon places us at the highest risk of being taken down and compromising our faith. There is a high probability that you live amongst the same things that Yahusha spoke against and that you have been affected by it. Either presently or in the past, you sat under teachers that were charged to lead you against faithful worship of Yahusha. If you say, not me, without ever doing this review, then it's most likely true in your regards. This requires some self-reflection and analysis. You may need to ask hard questions and you must review all the things you have done and still do in the name of Jesus. Make sure your faith is strongly rooted in the word and not rooted in what someone has taught you the word says. There is a very high probability that if you attend any of the churches of today, you are who Yahushua is speaking to in his letters of Pergamos. Do not be compromised. Read your Bibles, hold fast to your faith, and do not compromise yourself with this world and the apostates. He's watching. Do not do the things that he hates.
Next is the corrupt church. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things, says the son of Elohim, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a corrupt church. They had love, service, faith, and patience. But he still had things against them that will be a problem for them. Now this woman Jezebel is not the same Jezebel we read about in the Old Testament. The timelines aren't crossed. She is not the same one, but still guilty of the same actions. Yahushua was probably addressing the spirit of the woman more than her actual name. She was teaching and seducing her servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Yet she called herself a prophetess. She wasn't teaching to other pagans, but she infiltrated herself amongst the church and caused corruption. Those who fell for her seduction and committed adultery with her will experience great tribulation. Now when I say great tribulation, I'm not speaking of the great tribulation of the end time prophecy, but it's a reference to much trouble in their lives. This church is very similar to the church of Pergamos, and much of what I just said about the church applies to this one as well. I also will add to this and mention that the spirit of Jezebel is very much a thing. In part 7 of the History of Religion series, we see this woman's actions detailed. Beware of this Jezebel spirit. When I read this letter in Revelation, I immediately think of different examples like Beyonce and those who follow her. She's a Jezebel. I remember when she presented herself as a Christian, even did a song with Michelle about Jesus. But then she promoted pure rebellion for those that follow her. Kim Kardashian is another pure example of this. She promotes herself as a Christian while teaching wicked ways to the churches. In fact, she's a witch. The worst are people like Oprah Winfrey. She calls herself a Christian. My favorite Bible verse, because I am Christian, uh, is Acts something. But then promotes pure wickedness and rebellion to all who follow her. These examples I used are very polarized, but the spirit of Jezebel is everywhere in every church. And today it has gotten even worse. The Jezebel that you may be encountering is not limited to inside the church. When you follow these people, they are directly trying to remove you from your faith to have you commit adultery against Yah. So if you follow these examples I gave, and many others, you are guilty of what Yahusha said against this church. But again, it's not just limited to the examples I gave. There are others like these. They come across as believers in Yahusha, but they promote wickedness and rebellion. They promote the idea of entertaining wickedness. Beware and remove yourself from this wickedness. Do not be corrupt, aware of the spirit of Jezebel. Next is the dead church, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of Elohim and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before Elohim. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, 
I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not the father garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this church is very easily explained. They are dead. There is no more faith in them. He knew of them. He knows that there was a church of Sardis, but the reality is they were dead. They either no longer believed fully or their faith was unrecognizable. They did not stand up against evil. They were just dead. Their faith was dead. They acted as if they were a church by their name, but there was nothing in them. Now they knew of and believed in Yahusha, but it wasn't strong. The only thing that they could do was strengthen their faith. At this point in time, this is the time that we're most likely in with the church. A time period where faith in Yahusha is only by name and self-declaration and not by faith. The people of today don't believe. They like the idea of saying they are believers, but that's as far as they go. Nothing about their lives resembles that of a believer. Nothing about their way of thought resembles a believer. Most of the time, they aren't even convicted that they're wrong. They are a dead church. He says to them that he will come upon them as a thief. If you're in this dead church, he's talking to you. You will miss him. You must find your faith in him again. Read your Bible. Watch these videos like the History of Religion series. Be strong. Don't be a follower of the weak. Stop filling your flesh with garbage. Grow your strength back in him. Have fear of Yahuwah and become reborn in your spirit. Do not be of this dead church. Be mindful of it because this is strong right now. Next is the faithful church. Revelation chapter 3 verses 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. But he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my Elohim, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the new Jerusalem, which come down out of heaven from my Elohim. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is it. This is our goal. You want to be counted amongst the church of Philadelphia. This is my personal goal. I want to be of the faithful church. He set before us an open door, entrance into his kingdom that no one can shut. This church keeps his word. They don't deny his name. Because we kept his command to persevere, he will keep us from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world. This time he is speaking of is the Great Tribulation. Many consider this promise to mean that he will remove us before the Great Tribulation occurs. Or many believe that he will not remove us, but just protect us during the Great Tribulation. Whatever way he means it, it's what I want to happen for myself, for my family, and for you. This is the church. You must be a part of it the Church of Philadelphia. This will happen when you make him a priority in your life. You feed on his word as your daily bread. You trust him. You live in a relationship with him. You remove idols from your life. You bear your cross. You do not deny his name. You live for him and are faithful. Please make belonging to this church your goal. And the last church to discuss is the lukewarm church. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm 
and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There is so much that we can say about this church. This is many believers of today. They are a mix of the Church of Pergamos, the Compromised Church, the Church of Sardis, the Dead Church, and this church, the Lukewarm Church. In the Lukewarm Church, you believe in Yahusha, but you also believe in the world. You're hot and cold at the same time. You have faith, but you also desire to obtain the world as well, and you lack trust in Messiah. This is a mixture that makes you lukewarm. The Laodicean church was wealthy, and it assumed it didn't need anything, but it didn't realize it was spiritually impoverished. This is many in today's church, particularly here in America. They believe that because they go to church every Sunday, and maybe they are involved in the church, they play the piano, they are an usher, or in the choir, they believe that because of this activity, they are found right in the sight of Yah. They are in fact spiritually deluded. They think they are rich, but they're spiritually poor. They think that they are in need of nothing, but they are in fact poor in faith and spiritually blind and naked. He warned that if they do not repent, he's going to vomit them out of his mouth. This is a very severe message. These people have accepted Jesus, but instead of accepting and living through him, they accepted more of the world than of him. They mixed the hot with the cold and became lukewarm. The only way they would know this is by renewing their minds through Messiah, as we are all called to do. The only way of knowing if your mind is renewed or not is by lining up all views, traditions, and doctrines that you hold today with the word of Yah. Many just compare their walk with others and or what other churches are doing. They made their tradition more the final word, more than they let scripture be the final say on things. They partake in many practices that are not biblical, but more traditional, though they don't even know where the tradition started from. Even if someone shows them in scripture why the traditions are not biblical, they hold on to tradition more than they hold on to the word. We cannot live how Yah requires while at the same time live how the world requires. It is important that this is understood as we go throughout these last days. As the world draws further and further away from Yah, you should be seeing yourself moving further and further away from the world, its mindsets and its ways. Do not be lukewarm. Be hot for Yah. So these are the seven letters to the seven churches. I've made a chart that I've placed on my website. It lists all the churches, what they were commended for, and what they were criticized for, and the instruction that's given to them. Again, like I said in the beginning, this message is important to all who believe in Yahusha. The church today does not teach on this and has made many people believe that as long as they have made the decision to believe in Yahusha, they're good to go and there'll be no criticism of their walk. But that is not true. The early church also claimed belief in Yahusha and to be saved by him. And Yahusha, obviously, as you read through these letters, had many things to say. So you must understand that he wants you to be his. He wants you to follow him and his ways. I judge no one. I simply recognize how wicked this world is and how far deception has taken us from the Most High. I desire to bring things to the awareness of the church so they can do more self-reflection in their walk and relationships with Yahusha. It is important to remember that these messages are not to unbelievers, but to believers. These letters apply to all of us in some way. Hard self-analysis should be used so that you can determine what he is saying to you. He said in every letter to each church, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I'm certain that he will speak to you individually and make known to you what is needed to be known. 
All you must do is open up your ears and your heart. You must hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Do not feel prideful that you got it all together. Do not harden your heart and say, this message doesn't apply to you. This is very important. And if you believe in Yahusha, this message applies to you. Apply it to your life accordingly and prepare yourself for Yahusha. Time is running out. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like and share this video with others. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. Thank you for watching. As always, I would like to thank all those who support and contribute to this ministry. I thank you for your love and your support. You're truly a blessing during these times that we're in. I'm thankful you are blessed by this ministry, and I thank you for following Yah's call on your heart. Okay, thanks again for watching, everyone. I love you all.